And we do now move on to our first keynote address, which will then be followed by a conversation with our two Eden laureates, Lucy and Angie. So, Lucy, if I can ask you to take your seat, and hopefully Angie will appear as if by magic behind me. Um, but before they actually participate, it gives me a huge pleasure to invite the Honourable Julia Gillard to deliver our first keynote. Julia was Prime Minister of Australia, Chair of the Global Partnership for Education, and now Chair of the Wellcome Trust. And I have to say, as an Aussie myself who's followed her career with, with great interest, I am particularly delighted to welcome her here in person to speak. Julia, thank you for being with us, and over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to feel slightly nervous with uh, Angie looming over my shoulder like that. You, you'll be able to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down, depending on what you think of the content of this speech. Uh, what, what a great treat to join you all, though. Uh, hello to everybody who's joining online, but a particular hello to people who are in 3D in the room. How remarkable uh, to be gathered together at the Wellcome Trust. We're fond of saying science finds a way, and science has found a way to make sure that we can meet in person again, and I don't think we're ever going to take that for granted again in our lives. I've been asked today to share some reflections from my seven years chairing the Global Partnership for Education. So yes, you are listening to an ex-Prime Minister, an ex-chair of the Global Partnership for Education. I'm collecting former titles. Uh, but getting uh, ready for this talk really did force me down what is a long memory lane about the work that I did at the Global Partnership for Education. And if I was going to talk you through all of it, it would take all day. So I've tried to distill it down into a couple of major reflections that really powerfully struck me as I went down memory lane. But I do want to disclose that as I thought about the full seven years, it uh, really was very evident how much I had learned across the journey, which is another way of saying when I started, I really didn't know that much about international education. It is almost remarkable to me now, looking back on it, that the Global Partnership for Education invited me to become its chair. I came to the task, of course, having been a Minister for Education and a Prime Minister who focused on education, and particularly on reforms about quality and transparency, data and funding. And I knew of the Global Partnership for Education because at that stage Australia was one of its major funders. But I didn't know about its history in detail and I didn't know about its model for change. I knew some, but not all, of the players in the international education architecture. I had personally visited some GPE countries, uh, but I had never been to Africa, uh, where two-thirds of GPE countries are located. And whilst across all of my adult life I would have described myself as a feminist, I was unaware of the body of evidence that pointed to how hugely transformative educating girls is, not only for their lives, but for their families' lives, for their community, their nation, and ultimately our world. A long way of saying I had a lot to learn. And one of the things that I had to learn was about the way in which a multi-stakeholder partnership really needs to work if it is going to hold true to its stated ambition, and this is a stated GPE ambition, of being a country-led development model. I distinctly remember going to my first GPE board meeting. It was in March 2014 in Washington, and I was there to be appointed and to observe the meeting, not to chair it. It was being chaired by the then Minister for Education in Senegal, Minister Tiam, who chaired one of GPE's most important committees and went on to serve as my vice chair for several years. It was the first time that we had met. And he immediately impressed me, uh, not only for his knowledge and his expertise, but also his fortitude. I remember he had a crippling cold at the time, uh, but notwithstanding that was pushing through to chair this quite complex board meeting. And across the seven years, Minister Tiam and the Ministers for Education from developing countries who sat at the GPE board table increasingly took a more fundamental role in shaping the partnership. 
GPE was the successor to the UN Fast Track Initiative. And for some of the old timers in GPE, they remembered the UN Fast Track Initiative and they particularly remembered that its governance structure was one where donors met and sat at the table while representatives from developing countries sat in the seats behind them and observed. Seems incredible to say that now, but that was, you know, uh, around 20 years ago that a major education initiative on the global stage uh, thought that that was an appropriate way of working. GPE fortunately never worked like that, but it is one thing to say uh, that you are going to be country led, that you are going to privilege the voice of those who are leading nations that are in the change process, and it's another thing to do it. And ultimately, I think GPE did find the way to do it, but it was done because of developing country leadership, because Minister Tiam and others demanded that GPE set up new structures which enabled them to come together to prepare for board meetings and that we then, from then on, commenced our board meetings uh, with a statement from developing countries' ministers for education about what they wanted, indeed required, to see from the Global Partnership for Education at that stage of its decision making. It was achieved through their leadership but it was also achieved because the board generally and the GPE secretariat in particular was prepared to facilitate and to backstop uh, the arrangements necessary to bring people together to have the exchanges that enabled them to distill their views and to put their voice. At the same time as our governance was changing uh, with a greater, indeed a leading input from developing countries, our model of working within countries was changing uh, so that what was happening was much more customised for context on the ground and one in which there was much more local engagement and leadership from developing countries. Now, I go through all of that partly because I think it is to GPE's great credit, but really because I think it is one of the huge lessons for me from the seven years that I spent at GPE, and it needs to be one of the central reflections as we go about the discussions today. I think intellectually we all understand this agenda, uh, but operationally we often find it hard to achieve. Unfortunately, I think the white saviour complex is well and truly alive, and whilst we talk the language of partnership, actually we often practise interventions uh, that come from one and are uh, intervened into another's reality uh, without hearing the voice and hearing the voice very strongly. Giving ground requires someone to cede ground, and I think all of us find that quite hard to do. And I think in the international development community, as we get about tasks like equitable education, it can be very difficult for many entities, I'm th thinking of donors here, but others in the international architecture, to find the way to give that ground. It's incredibly important. The second uh, big distillation for me from my time at GPE is I went into it uh, very focused on education data. And I feel like I can talk about this honestly and openly in front of this group because I know I found my kind. We're all data nerds here and none of you are going to look down on me because I spent so much time uh, thinking about and drilling down into education data. I came out of my domestic experience as Minister for Education quite proud of the fact uh, that amongst the many changes we'd introduced had been a huge data transparency project. So now for every Australian school you can see freely available online uh, the standards that are being achieved in each school th uh, that's measured through national testing, the resources each school has available for the teaching and education task and the socioeconomic composition of the kids in the school.
and you can compare schools that are similar in terms of socioeconomic com uh, composition. So you can profoundly ask yourself a series of questions about what is making the difference to education outcomes here. Are there more resources being brought to bear in a school that is achieving higher, or is there something different in the educational practice that is enab enabling them to achieve higher? Having uh, done that work, uh, I was very convinced when I started my journey at GPE that we did need to see a revolution on data in international education. What, of course, I underestimated coming out of a context like Australia uh, is how difficult that is to do, to imagine a world in which we could get real-time and comparable education quality data from very different settings. You imagine Sierra Leone, Cambodia and Haiti and actually look at it and have it in real time. Um, I underestimated the capacity constraints and those capacity constraints continue unfortunately to speak loudly. But I also underestimated how contentious uh, much of this data work would be. And I think whilst we can't wave a magic wand and get rid of the capacity constraints, we can and we should take a profound step forward in the international debate about the ability of everyone to access the data. I think the things that are holding us back, number one, let's be frank, Transparent data makes people accountable and it is a natural human instinct uh, to try and shield yourself from that kind of accountability. But we've got to be uh, fierce enough with ourselves to put ourselves in that moment and to hold ourselves accountable. Uh, second, I think uh, there are a whole lot of education debates in high income countries which we have uplifted into the global debate and we pretend that they matter everywhere when they don't. I think many of our debates about crowded curriculum, teaching to the test and the like are debates that do not have global application and we should not pretend that they do. And then I think, because we are data nerds, we are very hardwired uh, to let uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, yes, it is you know, impossible to get perfect uh, education data uh, each time and every time, but we can get, and we should be able to get, at least one galvanising metric that we can look at globally to help us incentivise change. To give an example from the health community, maternal mortality rates have been tracked now very clearly uh, globally and country by country. You can get long-term trend line now, uh, now on maternal mortality rates. Now, does the maternal mortality rate tell you everything about the healthcare system? Clearly not. Does the maternal mortality rate tell you everything about female empowerment within a country? Clearly not. But the trend line tells you something. It tells you something if maternal mortality rates are consistently going down. It tells you something if they are consistently going up. And it tells you something if there has been a sharp change in either direction. And that bellwether can then enable you to go in and to investigate what is going on. I think it is our responsibility to find that galvanising metric for education. The World Bank has been uh, advocating for uh, reading at 10 years of age. Others would put different metrics, but at the end of the day, we need to settle this and we need to get on with it so that we can, as an education community, respond in a more agile fashion in real time. But second, and very importantly, we can speak to the world in a way which is digestible to the world about what is happening in education. And let's face it, one of our great strengths is our expertise, but one of our great challenges when we come to talk to others outside the education community is that we don't speak their language. Um, you know, I, I, when I was first at GPE, sat in many meetings, I don't think of myself as a silly person, uh, but I sat in many meetings where about 50 minutes in, I'd have to say to myself, I now have no idea what anybody is talking about. <laughs> and I had been a minister for education. Uh, so uh, just how dense and impenetrable much of our language is, I think, is a challenge we need to work our way through. And a galvanising metric would do that.
These are some of my key reflections from the time. But before I conclude, I would like to say a couple of things uh, in a role that doesn't have an X in front of it, fortunately, uh, which is my role as patron of CAMFED. Um, it is a delight to be with my colleagues and friends here today and to say on these two big themes that I've outlined to you, I think CAMFED is at the leading edge. Lucy, Angie and the CAMFED team have never been afraid to be held accountable based on the data. Indeed, they've made it a watchword of how they work and how they've got better and stronger over time. And second, I think CAMFED is at the leading edge in recognising that it is empowerment that makes a difference. And if you empower, then you need to give way so that the leadership of this incredibly important movement has uh, gone over time from being centred here in Cambridge to being centred uh, with Angie, with the leaders in Africa who are now driving CAMFED forward for its next generation and beyond. I think that that is a shining example of what we are all seeking to achieve. And so it's a real privilege to be here today for this conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Julia, and for sharing those insights and reflections with your GPE hat off and being able to be very free in, in what you've shared. And I think that some of the um, some of those insights and around the dynamics resonate so much. The power dynamics, um, the talking about the white saviour narrative, and I mean, it's just made me reflect on the fact that right from the outset in CAMFED, how we've worked is in relation to the power dynamics to the individual girl and how we hold ourselves accountable to her. And so I think that you know, addressing those power dynamics right from the individual, I mean, back to Boris's point, I think has been what has been fundamental to us growing our movement. And I think it's also important just to note that one thing that we are proud of in CAMFED is that the IDAM Prize was, re was recognising CAMFED as a team. And we have many of that team in this room and online, and many of the young women leaders online. And um, I think we have over a thousand people who have registered to watch this live stream, and many of them will be listening and cheering everything that you've said there. Um, but Julie, if I can just kick off and going back to GPE, could you share with us what was your most memorable moment? And if that's not something that you want to share publicly, <laughs> then of what, can you give something of what you're most proud of that GPE achieved during your time as chair? Uh, well, I'm happy, happy to do a memorable uh, moment and just uh, some of the things I'm proud of. Uh, just for uh, sheer uh, impact, uh, mainly in your family and friends, you know, mostly uh, my family in particular have watched my political career with one eyebrow raised. Um, to this day, my nephew Tom thinks that the most, uh, the biggest and most important thing I've ever achieved is there was a time when they were getting me to uh, be an early reviewer of Game of Thrones. And so I got early access to a number of episodes and he thought that was a big achievement. Everything else paled into insignificance compared with that. Uh, so uh, a moment like that was obviously uh, going on to tour uh, with Rihanna uh, when we went to Malawi. Uh, but what really struck me in that moment is honestly just how globalised uh, the culture is, that you could be in a school in Malawi, it was a secondary school, uh, it was a girls' school, and from, you know, they hadn't announced that she was going to be there, uh, but from the moment she stepped onto the school premises, uh, like a Pied Piper, she was um, being pursued by uh, screaming schoolgirls uh, who all knew who she was and were singing her songs back to her. Uh, so familiar were they with her work. And it, it just was a wonderful picture about uh, globalisation interconnection, 
but also aspiration. You know, how how those uh, girls who were uh, screaming in her wake actually get a future. And she herself uh, was very thoughtful about that because she had left school incredibly young because she had been discovered uh, incredibly young and gone on uh, tour and circuit um, as, a, as a rock star incredibly young and uh, was very conscious that because she'd never finished secondary school that there were a series of things in her life that she didn't have despite all of the fame and the wealth that has, uh, that has come to her uh, through her musical talents. Um, on the what am I proud of, um, I'm, I'm proud of, uh, of the, the strengthening of the de developing country uh, partner voice. I'm also uh, very proud of the way uh, GPE over time has uh, better taken the case for education to the world, not only on its own behalf, but generally. I think we, uh, when I left GPE, it had a much greater capacity uh, to mobilise people in support of the education cause than it had at the start. And we need uh, that mobilisation because there is still so much to do. And I've got a question for you and also Angie. Uh, we'll bring Angie into the conversation. Uh, so turning to the two of you, obviously laureates um, and being uh, recognised here. Uh, and between you, I'm not going to guess, uh, Angie and Lucy, how many decades of experience in girls' education you've got between you and how it's divided. Uh, but if you want to uh, make a declaration about that, I won't stop you. Uh, but you've seen, seen a lot of change and progress in girls' education. Uh, but what do you see as the greatest challenges that are still there to be solved in girls' education? And Angie, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Julia. It's so surreal, the power of technology. Uh, but like Dorothy, I'm still very envious of all of you joining this from Jesus College. The gift of meeting in person is precious. COVID has taught us to cherish it even more. Anyway, to, to the question, there is just so much to say. But I want to start with the fact that there is no denying, dismissing, or minimizing the challenge presented by the COVID pandemic now and into the future, especially on children and particularly on girls' well-being and learning. I know that we'll hear more on that in the next panel, no, in the next panel discussion, so I'll not touch on that, but that's the biggest challenge of our time. But besides the pandemic, I can think of two other huge challenges facing girls' education today. First and foremost is the realities of the context in sub-Saharan Africa. The context remains dire. It's a context mired with inequality and serious equity issues. UNESCO says that of all the regions, Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rates of education exclusion. And we know that this has been further exacerbated by the pandemic. I would want to speak more to the divide in learning, which is worsening at many levels. And this is as a result of the pandemic, but even so with the digital divide. When schools started shutting down and everything, everybody says we're going online learning. But what this did is it covered up the massive disparities in access to technology, in availability of technology and affordability of that. There are millions of children on the continent of Africa that are still lagging behind. And we, I know it's beyond as well. And there are millions that are threatening to be left behind. We must keep in mind that there were millions of children in Africa that were out of school even prior to COVID. Secondly is the exclusion that is taking place at many levels. This is both the exclusion of girls from school and the exclusion of young people from opportunity. For me, there's often this hidden and invisible challenge of exclusion within the school system itself which manifests as erratic attendance, poor participation, poor completion rates, especially by girls. I can go on and on, you know, on the many present challenges for girls in this season, but that would not be the complete story because there are ways we can step up to this challenge, ways we have stepped up to the challenge. Take for example, the comfort learner guides, you know, Dorothy started touching on that. Lena guys stepped up in a big way since the onset of COVID. 
And Lena guys are young women high school graduates. We have experienced firsthand the barriers to education, received support to go to school, and are now returning to their local schools as mentors and as role models. Lena guides offer vulnerable girls targeted individual mentorship, home visits, or links to additional support services to help the girls and other children remain in school and succeed in school. I want to say and make it clear that these are part of a wider support system to the most marginalized children. They're free teachers to teach. In the past year, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis and associated school closures, Lena Guides acted as a critical home school link. They're providing a mechanism to continue welfare and learning support to vulnerable girls and ensuring they were in a position to return to school and continue to learn. So over 95%, 95, 95 of comfort supported girls returned to school. That's a huge fit. So while there are immense challenges facing girls' education today, we are not without very promising, highly cost-effective and scalable solutions to deploy. Yeah, and to, to pick up on that, um, Julia, and you mentioned bellwether, and I do see girls' education as a barometer. It's like the canary down the mine. When you get political instability, economic instability, climate instability, and indeed health instability, girls' education is the first to be affected. And at the, on that point of an indicator, I think the dropout rate of girls from school is the indicator to watch and is the indicator to challenge all of us. And it's Angie mentioned, you know, even before the pandemic, the dropout rates were high. So in rural, rural sub-Saharan Africa, only one in 20 girls who entered primary education went on to complete secondary school. And that level of dropout is huge. And I think we all have to recognise the precarious hold on education that girls have and to recognise that it does require a joined up holistic approach to secure that hold one that goes beyond the school gates and involves girls' communities. And Angie gave the Learner Guide as an example of a mechanism that does strengthen that critical homeschooling. And I would just add one other statistic, which is that um, in schools in Zambia, where Learner Guides were operating over a two-year period, there was a 42% fall in dropout rate among girls due to pregnancy and early marriage. And that has implications for girls' health and well-being that go well beyond their education, as, as Celeza mentioned, and why it's so vital that we address the issue of girls' dropout from school. And um, I would also say that uh, you know, there is a challenge to the international community for the need for continued investment in girls' education. We have to accept that it's never job done and that non-investment is not a neutral position. So, you know, just as dropout rates of girls from school is an indicator of instability, so ultimately that dropout fuels instability. And we see that in a downward spiral in health outcomes and other development indicators. But we know the returns on girls' education are huge. And so my hope is that the Global Partnership for Education will continue to be a driving force in that regard, to your point, and in bringing other development partners along too to make meaningful financial investment. And if I could ask both of you a sort of follow-up question, you mentioned um, how other factors, including climate, uh, can impact girls' education. I mean, we're obviously having a global conversation, but we're here in the UK, and the UK this year uh, hosted the G7, hosted the Global Partnership for Education replenishment event, but is still to host the climate change talks. So COP um, will be in Glasgow very shortly next month. What would you hope to see from leaders at those climate discussions and what do you see as the interconnection between climate and girls' education? That's, that's a very critical question of our time, Julia. And uh, speaking from Africa at the moment, there, there is huge impact of climate change. And the tragedy of it is oftentimes communities in the rural areas do not understand what's causing it and how to protect themselves. So uh, I think for me, there's a key message I would like you know, to be taken to COP. And, and this is that girls' education brings through women who are climate smart leaders. They, there are no two ways about it. And it's important to understand that. And, and um, I know I've talked about you know, things very generally. There are thousands of young women I know who are climate smart leaders. 
who inspire me every day and they're achieving phenomenal results with boldness and determination in the face of adversity, particularly how they rally their communities around climate action and support for the most vulnerable children. But I would want to share a story you know, of one of the young women, Rufaro, just so that you know, we bring it home and, and say, these are the lives that we're talking about. So Rufaro was one of the you know, young women that, was, that had been supported by Comfort. She was the first member of her family to pursue a higher education and earn a degree. She was raised by a grandmother in rural Zimbabwe. They relied on subsistence farming to try and support the family. They barely harvested enough to feed the family. Because of that, Rufaro's community selected her for comfort support, and she was able to enroll and complete high school. Understanding firsthand the battle rural farmers face daily, Rufaro went on to graduate and to study sustainable agriculture. After graduation, she returned to a village where she is now and launched an initiative she called Green Life with the sole purpose of passing on what she learned to others. So a Green Life initiative seeks to combine modern technology with traditional methods to help families access groundwater and improve their productive, productivity. She uses uh, a solar powered bowl system to supply clean drinking water and water for horticultural production, thus helping families to secure both nutrition and income all year round. She works with a network of agripreneurs uh, from our Comfort Association network, Dorothy mentioned that, and other extension workers in our network. And together they pass on climate smart skills to hundreds of forgotten farmers. They train women to make organic compost, to improve use, preserve food using solar dryers, add value to produce you know, to products and they go and sell, they weave baskets out of waste paper. So they also do recycling, reduce and repurposing. She trains community members on financial literacy. She helps them to access small loans, start businesses, understand supply chains. She herself runs thriving in a thriving agricultural business. And from her returns, she also supports other children to go to school. It's a powerful multiplier, an unstoppable virtuous cycle, unleashed by education. But most importantly, it's addressing the climate change head on. So I go back to my message that I, you know, for me, needs to be taken to COP26, that girls' education brings together women who are climate smart leaders. Women like Rufaro here today that I mentioned. So leaders this planet needs. So if we're going to address climate change head on, let's invest in girls' education. That's my message, Julie. Yeah, and just building on that, um, and thanks, Angie. And yeah, I think going into COP26, as we know, girls' education has been um, seen as highly effective in combating climate change, um, mainly because of its effect on family size, leading to um, decreasing pressure on natural resources, lowering carbon emissions. And in fact, I think combined with access to family planning services, it has been recognised as the one of the most effective strategies in combating climate change. But I think we also have to recognise there's a downside in that argument, that the global push for girls' education can be seen as a means of population control in countries where per capita emissions are a mere fraction of those in high-income countries. And I think that risks overshadowing the critical imperative of girls' education in the context of climate disruption and the value to individuals who, through their education, are better able to make climate smart decisions, as Angie was describing, and to cope in the face of climatic disruption. But the evidence, and as Angie mentioned, points to the fact that women's leadership does lead to better environmental decision making. And I think to quote Mary Robinson, UN Rights Commissioner, climate change is a man-made problem that requires a feminist solution. And the foundation for women's leadership, for women to step into positions of authority on climate action, is girls' education. So I think if we come at girls' education and into COP26 from that angle, then the case for girls' education in combating climate change is, is incontrovertible. So on that incontrovertible note, <laughs> I think it's now time to open up um, to invite questions. I know we have some questions coming in online, but I'll also um, invite um, a few questions from the floor. You do need to use a mic for translation purposes. Okay. 
it appears. <laughs> well, well. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to ask if you, you know, what, what, if you had a billion dollars to spend on this issue in Africa, how would you spend it? I mean, what, what, how could money make a difference? That's uh, most, most effectively. Julia, can I ask you to start with that question from the perspective of GPE and looking at the kind of investments and the commitments that have been made to GPE? Uh, a billion dollars is a lot of money, uh, but uh, uh, given the scale of the task, uh, we know that a, a billion dollars isn't, isn't sufficient. But in terms of best buys, I think we best achieve when the global system works together in concert. And so I wouldn't give it to one thing. What I would do is I would obviously want to further strengthen GPE because I think if GPE is not there uh, doing the system-wide strengthening work, the planning work, then we can't enable at scale the changes that we want to see. I would too uh, invest in, uh, and Amel Kabul is here, the Education Outcomes Fund, uh, which is an emerging player on the global landscape and is showing what can be done uh, with uh, social impact bonds, uh, investment, um, uh, impact investment and uh, results-based uh, approaches. So I think that would that needs uh, GPE doing the system's work, but it's a, a way of accelerating and modelling change that can then be picked up by the system overall. Uh, I would invest in Education Cannot Wait because I think its specialist model for uh, emergency conditions is very important. And I think agile philanthropy like CAMFED uh, would also need to be invested in because CAMFED shows us through its ability to innovate and to hold itself to account uh, what can be done. And once again, I think the trick is, and we're never very good with this trick, unfortunately, is to look what is happening what is happening through agile philanthropy, through things like impact investing, and then to take the lessons into the system at scale. So I'd invest in those things, but I'd try to do it in a way that meant the system was reinforcing uh, the good that each other was doing. Judy, um, thanks, Julia. And Angie, do you want to add to that? Sure, definitely, Lucy. Uh, Julia touched on that. And I think in the earlier remarks, she did touch on a very critical point around um, the voices that are brought to the table to be able to make uh, decisions on the solutions that are deployed. So I'll not belabor that further. I'll also just trace the point around ensuring that there's sufficient safety nets for those that are currently being left behind by the system as well as ensuring that there are resources to build accountability in the system particularly to the most marginalized within it. Because if that system can work for those that are um, least served by it, it can work for everybody. Yeah, and I think that's some of the evidence that we've been able to bring through through our partnership with the Real Centre is looking at the fact that if you can target investment to the most marginalized within the system, it can have that lift up effect um, for all children. So any other questions from within the room before we turn online? Yes, gentlemen at the front. Um, thank you so much. A very quick question. Can, can you help us understand the role of teachers in particular in uh, m helping to uh, improve the uh, accessibility or the outcome for uh, girls' education? Just focusing on the role of teachers. Well, I, I might say something more broadly about teachers and then uh, Lucy and Angie can really focus on girls' education. Um, I, I, I think one of the, the ways we bedevil ourselves in the global education debate is we use this word teacher uh, and by it me, we mean everyone from uh, an untrained person who's standing in front of a classroom in a poorer community uh, through to a Finnish PhD holder. And I'm not sure that the one word is helping us with all of that. Um, in, once again, to do a comparison with the medical community, if I use the terminology uh, birth attendant and the terminology obstetrician, uh, you would understand that they are both in the business of uh, making sure babies come safely into the world, but they are at different skill levels. 
Uh, and I think we need to categorise more clearly uh, so uh, we can build a workforce that can uh, get across uh, the traditional teaching task, but actually all of the other allied tasks that we need, we know need to be done if we are going to outreach beyond the school gate to the most marginalised to ensure their inclusion, if we are going to enable children with disabilities to be fully included, if we are going to enable those most at risk of being left behind uh, to catch up through a remedial education and additional programs. And we're not in any world, I don't think, going to have uh, three-year university trained or four-year university trained people in sufficient numbers to do all of those things. So we need a teaching and a para-teaching workforce uh, and then we need a, you know, absolute um, elite end of teaching who can then nurture the other teachers uh, to make all of the system work. And I'm not sure we categorise and think as clearly as we should about these workforce challenges. Yeah, and I think we would... Add to that, I think our approach in CAMFED is also recognising the huge burden that is on the shoulders of individual teachers and how do we create the support system, how do we create the learning team that will also be able to free up teachers, as Angie said, to be able to teach. And also recognising that um, in the areas in which we're working, in, in rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa, the majority of teachers are coming from outside of those communities, often not being able to speak the mother tongue. There is a big bridge to cross in enabling them to reach out to, and particularly the most marginalised children, to support their participation in class. I think for us as well, is about how do we bring through that pipeline of future trained teachers and the Learner Guide is a stepping stone in that regard in that their qualification is accredited to enable them to then access formal teacher training. So ultimately, you're bringing through the future teachers, the future education leaders who understand the context in which they're teaching, have the connection to those communities and are more well positioned to be part of a wider learning team, a wider support system. But I think the other important dimension to our work with teachers is just as we look at the um, psychosocial support to girls, it's also about the psychosocial support to teachers, many of whom are having to deal with very traumatic situations, particularly if they're coping with situations of extreme vulnerability among the children that they're working with and that they need a support system around them. And that's something that we're working and looking at with ministries of education. Angie, I don't know if you want to come in on, on this point about teachers. Uh, I shouldn't come after you and Julia because you took all my points. It's like you're seeing my notes. <laughs> I, I, I just want to rephrase the point that teachers are phenomenally important. I, I can speak to the many teachers that you know I met on my path and how they helped me to not only learn, but to also cope with disadvantage and actually coming from a family that was struggling to meet my course. But I also just want to say it's important for us to also ensure that teachers have got the support that they need. You, Lucy used the word, you know, psychosocial support there, that they've got the support that they need to be able to also teach, but also to recognize that in some of the communities that we work with, they are all, they might, you know, so the female teachers might find themselves as only one female teacher in a context where the majority are male. So they might also at times be dealing with the same gender challenges that the students are facing. So I'm just saying that it's important to realize that teachers cannot do this alone. They need a circle of support around them in supporting children as well. So let's keep that in mind that they're phenomenally important, but this, this should never be their burden alone to bear or burden to bear alone. Thanks, Angie. We'll take um, one more question that's coming in online before we close the session. And Julia, I'm gonna put this one to you first of all, because I think this also speaks to your um, hat on with the Global Institute for Women's Leadership. Um, and this is a question from Laura in Liverpool. It feels like girls' and women's rights are being rolled back all over the world and we're fighting battles we thought we'd won decades ago. Where does your biggest hope come from? Uh, yes, there uh, have been some uh, depressing days, that's true, and a lot of the data uh, coming out about uh, women's positions uh, through the pandemic and as a result of the pandemic, I think, is truly troubling. Uh, but uh, I reassure myself, um, um, sort of moment by moment, uh, that the direction of travel over time, whilst it's not linear and it's not always upwards, uh, is in the right direction. 
And I do think that the dialogue now is increasingly focused on gender equality. I mean, one of the things that, um, well, two things really that struck me about the, the pandemic and the public discourse around it, of course, the predominant public discourse has been around public health and how we manage the pandemic. But almost at the same time that that started, people started talking about how do we manage mental health alongside the pandemic. And I really think if the pandemic had happened five years ago, that would not have happened. And then quite quickly, we were also talking about the gender dimensions of the pandemic, who was doing the caring at home, who was losing the jobs, uh, who was at risk in the health and caring professions, uh, what was happening with domestic violence. And then that led on to a time when we were lauding female leadership and how well women leaders were doing navigating the pandemic. Uh, so the very fact that even in a time of such extreme strain, people would be thinking about gender equality and bringing that lens to the public dialogue, that does give me a lot of heart for the future. Great. Thanks, Julia. And Angie, do you want a final word on that? I'm glad we are not where we used to be. We are certainly not where my grandmother and my mother used to be on the spectrum of gender equality. And for me, that gives me hope that tomorrow will be better. But we shall not to sit on our laurels and think this thing will happen on its own. There is still a lot of investment and effort that needs to be made. And on my final words, I just want to reiterate key things that I said today, that there is no sugar coating. Uh, the immense challenges facing girls' education today, yet we are not without very promising, highly cost-effective and scalable solutions to deploy. We need to collaborate more. We need to look at what is working and do that at scale. And for COP26, let us remind the world that girls' education brings through women who are climate smart leaders, the leaders this planet needs. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for this opportunity. Thanks, Angie, and thanks, Julia, and thanks for being you know, an inspiration to all of us through your leadership in the GPE, Julia, and for everything that you're going on to lead going forward. Thank you, Julia, Lucy, Angie. It's wonderful to have you speaking so passionately about these issues, and I'm sure you can see why they were two very, very worthy EDAN laureates.